Captain's Log, Stardate 58381.3 The USS Berlin is en route to Navarus Colony, where our fleet liaison officer, Lexor, is receiving the Karagite Order of Heroism for his actions saving the Cardassian colonists from the disastrous dust storms that ravage the planet. This isn't the first time the Berlin has visited Navarus Colony, and I hope relations between the Federation government there and the Cardassian colonists have settled. We're also here to assist a research team with newly discovered artefacts pertaining to a civilization that predates the colony by some centuries, seemingly wiped out, possibly by the storms that ravage the planet. So the USS Berlin is an intrepid class ship, so it's the same class as Voyager, and it uh, drops out of warp just on the edge of the system. It's little nacelles folding back down to its flat posture, and then it impulses in towards the... Um, third planet of uh, the system and Navarus colony is a basically an M-class moon uh, so it's habitable in orbit around a red gas giant so the way that its orbit um, and its rotation works um, a lot of the time the night here is really beautiful it's a almost like a kind of dusk um, as the gl the red glow bouncing off the uh, gas giant uh, from its star um, illuminates the sky. So the nights here very often aren't actually dark, and it's probably every couple of weeks or so that the whole planet heads into darkness for uh, like a while. After that, the the kind of season is kind of maintained by this uh, nighttime glow. So it takes a little bit of adjustment for the colonists to. To, to settle here, but once they do, it's a it's a beautiful thing, and the Berlin heads into orbit. I can give you folks some time to chat a little bit, kind of get a little bit into character, introduce your characters as well, uh, before we head down to the ceremony. I can introduce Lexor then. He is Ferengi. Uh, he's got dark orange skin like all Ferengi do, uh, enlarged cranial orbs, large ears, and very very sharp teeth. Ferengi and Starfleet are, of course, rare, very, very rare. But uh, Lexor is not the first to have abandoned the uh, never-ending pursuit of Latinum for uh, uh, the higher calling that the Federation offers. He uh, originally grew up on the homeworld, Ferenginar, and he was set to take over the family business. He had the, the lobes for it, so to speak, but well, it's a long story that involves his father entering into some very risky business agreements, failing to live up to his obligations, and um, almost being forced to sell poor Lexor into indentured servitude. The only thing that saved him from this fate was his father breaking a contract with another Ferengi, which is, of course, completely unthinkable. It led to the, the Ferengi Com Commerce Authority, the FCA, the feared FCA, revoking his father's business license. That's the harshest form of punishment that any Ferengi can get, and led to him and his family being ostracized from society. His father took his life uh, in shame, and uh, with any luck he has been able to bribe his way into the di divine uh, treasury, but the, the vault of eternal destitution is perhaps more likely, given what happened. Um, having experienced this dark side of Ferengi culture, uh, he uh, headed for the Federation, a path that eventually led him to, uh, to Starfleet and to the USS Berlin and uh, to the events on uh, Navarro's colony that uh, he finds himself quite surprised at well, what he uh, was able to achieve there together, of course, with the, the, uh, the crew members of, of that ship. And uh, right now he's serving as fleet liaison officer and he's got the uh, rank of lieutenant. And with him there is... I am Nira Kada, Lieutenant Commander Nira Kada. I am a Betazoid, so for all physical appearances I seem identical to human individuals. I am a woman in my mid-thirties, blonde with short hair styled in a modern fashion, quite thin. I was raised on a prosperous Betazoid colony, somewhere deep in Federation space, and very quickly wished to join Starfleet to aid my people and aid the galaxy as a whole. I specialised in diplomacy and politics, as well as engineering. 
meaning my position now as Lieutenant Commander is primarily as the Operations Manager on most missions on the USS Berlin. My record is largely exemplary, with no major infractions for the most part, only one case of insubordination, but that was overwritten ever so slightly because it turned out in that case that I was correct to call out my superior, for they had made an error, and luckily I was able to save the USS Berlin from a very unpleasant engineering situation that occurred because of that little adventure. That was some time ago though, and I've been serving happily under the current commander on the USS Berlin for some time. And we have uh, Commander Helsing as well, right? Commander Jala Helsing, uh, Chief of Security aboard the USS Berlin. A short um, woman of uh, light brown skin color with um, <clears throat> roots hailing from South Africa in on Earth, actually. Um, her parents were both avid politicians that struggled a lot um, with what they deemed were injustices in the, the system. Curiously enough, they were both on opposing sides, uh, of course, which led to Yala's upbringing to be very much flavored with pol politics and um, controversy, uh, which led her to choose another path in life, not an entirely surprising. Um, she, as soon as she could, she enrolled in Starfleet and made a pretty solid career there. Um, she, she is, she's a dirty worker. Um, she is tenacious, but she hasn't really made a name for herself. Um, kept a fairly low profile uh, thus far. Uh, but uh, she loves her Starfleet and she loves the family aboard the ship. She struggled a lot through uh, Starfleet Academy. Since she chose to go into security, a lot of a lot of the other people there were taller and bigger than she was. So she struggled really, really hard. Uh, but she made it out on top uh, in the end. And uh, she's quite well fit for uh, her age. She's pushing on 50. She's 47. So... And she's been in the Starfleet for quite some time. She's got dark curly hair that she keeps in a tight bun and it's got grayings at the temples. Um, she usually... She's not the one that smiles that often, but um, when she does, it's, it, it's like another person. So uh, we are perhaps in the mess hall then of the, uh, the ship, uh, enjoying some nice hot beverages uh, during a break let's say that uh, so so Lexor is, is sitting there and uh, see perhaps one of you going up to the replicator to get something what are you who, who is it and, and what are you getting I am going to get myself a nice glass of Bajoran tea which I find stimulating not only for the mind but the soul well are you excited about the reward you're going to be getting I can't say it's not deserved. I'm enjoying a sluggo cola uh, here, and um, I look up. Oh, it's a great honor, uh, of course. Uh, I, I don't still know what I'm going to say. Um, I'm going to be expected to hold some kind of speech, won't I? Oh, most definitely. But don't worry, you'll be fine. Just speak from the heart, be honest, and people will appreciate that. I will try my best. I... I suppose I should try to avoid uh, quoting any rules of acquisition while I'm there, right? I laugh a little and say, maybe for the best. After all, while your culture has many fascinating subsets, I feel that you're showing that you can be better than, dare I say, some Ferengi who care only for profit. Commander Helsing enters. Um, she's she just like she scans the room, sees you guys standing there. Uh, or sitting there uh, talking and just walks straight up to you. Lieutenant Lexor? Commander Helsing? Lieutenant Commander Cater? Commander Helsing? I hope all is well. Quite so. Uh, Lieutenant Lexor, I just need to inquire a few things about the security detail for the ceremony. I hope you have received proper instructions. 
I bring up my pad. Uh, I haven't seen it uh, yet. Uh, oh, here it is. Yeah. Yes. Yes, Commander. Let me study it. Uh, that's good. Uh, it's apparent that you you know the details of this and and don't deviate in any kind, especially on how you, hmm, let's say, present yourself towards the Cardassians. Of course, I I am aware of uh, the, how sensitive our relations with the Cardassians uh, are. Of course, uh, there's a lot of history, a lot of things for us to uh, yes to steer clear of uh, in in uh, our dealings. There here. certainly are, but. Again, hopefully, this is all part of better progress, moving on from the past and the troubles we've had with them, and moving forward to a better relationship with them and the Federation. Hmm, agreed. I certainly hope so. Lieutenant Commander, that is, of course, uh, what we all uh, anticipate and hope for, but uh, you can never be too prepared. Oh, I know. I agree fully, and I smile. Would you mind if I joined you for a glass? Of course. Oh, of course. I can recommend the Slugo Cola. Well, I'll take that uh, recommendation under consideration. I'll be right back. And I walk over to the replicator. After a short while, I come back with a a glass of water. I sit down. As I sit down, I am very aware that fully mind-reading my fellow crew members is rude and not something you do on a whim. However, as a Betazoid, sometimes I get little surface thoughts or even surface feelings Yes, so in this case, yes, what are the sort of surface thoughts of my two friends? I won't probe, but do I just get anything passively? Well, from Lexor, you would get... Um, he's very nervous. He is a young uh, lieutenant, of course. He's not that, that uh, far uh, away from having graduated uh, Starfleet. And uh, he's, of course, one of the, the few Ferengi. Um, and he knows how his species is, uh, is seen by not just members of the Federation, but certainly also the Cardassians. So he's a... a Nervous, but um, he's supposed to be honored here, so he's also a little bit proud. Yeah, and I think the surface thoughts from uh, Commander Helsing is pride as well. Uh, not necessarily about what the Alexor has done, but uh, just a general sense of pride of the what the Starship fleet has been able to to accomplish. Mm. I smile a little, these surface thoughts washing over me, which again is natural for me, and I lean over to Lexor just a little and say, you don't need to be so anxious. You're going to be fine. If anything, it's going to be much easier than the original reason you got the reward in the first place. I suppose you're right. Yeah, this is going to be good. Uh, Commander Helsing gets a, a bip on her comm badge for an incoming message. It is the captain who asks you to report to Transporter Bay 2. To the Transporter Bay. It's time. Ooh. So the actual ceremony itself is going to take place on board. Um, so people are being beamed up from the um, surface to come here. And this is some dignitaries and stuff, um, as well as um, another awardee, um, someone who's also receiving uh, a scientific award, and... Um, a civilian scientist by the name of Elanwa, um, and she is a, a Dojian. Uh, she'll be beaming aboard, as well as some Cardassian and uh, other Federation dignitaries um, from the colony, um, and then they'll be hosted in the diplomatic suite where, Lexor, your ceremony will take place. Very good. And, um, I mean, I'm wearing my dress uniform in that case. I'm uh, I'm ready to uh, to look my best for the, the, uh, the award then. Lieutenant Lexor, let me ex- escort you to the transporter bay. Thank you, Commander Helsing. You'll head over to uh, transporter room two. Um, join the captain, and there, um, beaming aboard, are the dignitaries. There's uh, an initial wave of dignitaries and handshakes and salutations, and they are escorted by a couple of the security team uh, down to the diplomatic suites um, on deck five. And then you um, uh, see another group beamed aboard, one of which contains um, this Adosian scientist. Um, and she introduces herself as Alanwa. Um, and she's going to be receiving a scientific award. Uh, Lexor, she particularly kind of hangs around you more than anyone else just in the transporter bay after she introduces herself. Um, you don't need a check to tell that she is looking um, 
excited, if a little nervous as well. I lean over to her. Are, are you also nervous? <laughs> uh, yes. Th this, um, I have not received an award before. Me neither. I I'm so excited. I, I just hope I don't s mess it up somehow. She points over to the um, petty officer who's at the control panel, and she asks, "Is, is that the controls for the transporter?" Uh, yes. I uh, would like to speak to operations soon. I am very interested. Our research and part of why you're here is 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 because of my work. Uh, I'd be very keen to begin understanding its processes and uh, and its capabilities beyond the transporters we have on the planet. Oh, certainly. Uh... I'll uh, make sure that you uh, you get access to what you need to get access to, of course. Thank you. And then she's kind of uh, escorted uh, as well, and then the rest of you uh, and the captain follow. Um, the captain's then paired up with her um, as a kind of a, a diplomatic uh, nod, and then uh, you folks are now basically heading towards the uh, diplomatic suites for the ceremony. Is there anything you'd like to do or, or shout about in between that time? I suppose... Once again, it is after all something I can't actively turn off unless I really try. What sort of emotions and surface thoughts am I getting from our guests, especially this lovely scientist? The the kind of dignitaries are more um, local dignitaries. So they would be like the governor of a region or a particular settlement and stuff like that. Um, they're quite happy being here. Some of them are probably just here for the nibbles. Um, others genuinely hail Lexor as a hero um, and are very pleased to meet him. A bit like they'd be meeting a celebrity. There's a bit of, uh, there's a bit of, uh, what do you call it? Um, like starstruck uh, about meeting him that you can't help but pick up on. Uh, that, yeah, then there's the scientist, uh, Elanwar, who um, is kind of nervous as well, um, but she, overall she's kind of quite excited. Um, and the kind of surface thoughts for her. She is a little distracted by the uh, experience of the transport and looking around the transport at bay. So she seems um, a little fixated, kind of in the moment on that. I do find myself thinking how unusual that is. Transportation technology, after all, isn't a rarity, but maybe in her case it is. Maybe we'll have a chat about that later. Otherwise, I'm happy just to follow with the others and make sure everything is running smoothly. And, of course, offer some greetings to all the guests, as is my training. I mean, I I suspect that, that the captain has required all the commanders and a lot of the officers to participate in all this. So uh, I think uh, Yala is having a bit hard time letting it go and trusting that everything will work without her you know keeping an eye on everything so I think she spends a lot of time during this trying to just get a feel for the situation if there's like is, is everyone here happy and just you know joyful or is there actually some kind of tension anywhere in the room or between any people all right, Jenny, roll me the first roll of the game. Yeah. So uh, let's go over some of the process as well as we've gone into the mingling stage of the evening. Right. So um, I'm going to ask for an insight and security check. So you've got uh, attributes and disciplines, and these are the things that you pair up together in order to get your target number on a d20. So each d20 that you roll, and you roll two d20 uh, as a kind of standard, um, on each of those, you want to roll equal or under that target number. Um, so what is your insight plus your security? I've got eight uh, in insight and five in security, so that brings it to 13. Nice. So you want each dice to roll a 13 or under to score a success. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to treat this um, as a difficulty zero test. Um, so that means that you will automatically succeed. But I'm going to get you to roll because you then score momentum for each additional success you needed that you that you got that you didn't need. Yep. Um, and each one of those, then we can use to we can spend the momentum that generates in order to ask some questions about the scene, and I have yep. to answer them truthfully. And I'll make a roll. 
gives me two. Yeah. Okay. Momentum. So two momentum, and what I'll say here is let's let's spend those two momentum in order to obtain information. So you've got two questions uh, to ask me about the scene, and I have to answer truthfully. This uh, sweet uh, um, scientist that seems so interesting in the transporters. Um, she seems very nervous. Is she, she, or a bit anxious even? Um, does she seem nervous uh, in a like a positive way, or is there something else weighing on her? They say that her work has been quite intrusive, and um, they're almost kind of annoyed or put out by some interference that she's had in local affairs or the actual lives of, of uh, citizens but she's managed she's always managed to secure um, permission from either local government or from the kind of uh, federation like science council to pursue her research because she's uh, the, the research that she's doing is is being uh, into a kind of precursor civilization that was there before the colony was established by the Cardassians um, so it's an archaeological um, survey in, in essence um, so she's she can be kind of quite pushy you you get the sense that she's always been bothered by the kind of lack of resources that the demilitarized zone and particularly the kind of Cardassian border area has had and to have a federation starship here um, means that she's very excited at the chance of using what it has so amongst the other dignitaries and, and diplomats or whatever uh, was sent up, um, is there anyone uh, or does there seem to be any kind of conflict between any people? You get, a, you get a sense of that. You get a sense of some unease between local dignitaries. And there's, there's like I say, majority Cardassian local politicians. Um, and then there's a, also a few. Uh, there's a... A couple human and another, say, Bolian. Well, in that case, I try, of course, to stay close to them during the the events. Leading up to your uh, acceptance of the award, um, it's the captain that has the honour and the duty to award you the Karagai Order of Heroism. Captain Temek goes through the logs, some of the log entries of the um, event that Berlin was here for and um, exemplifies the bravery of a young lieutenant um, and then introduces you. Uh, So Lexor, the floor is yours. How would you like to accept the award? I think his his, uh, nervousness starts to to show us as soon as he's supposed to have this uh, speech and uh, in fairly uh, normal Ferengi fashion, he he begins boasting quite a bit about uh, what he what he did there and how important his role was, uh, and and you can see him getting very very excited and his uh, he, he keeps bla- blathering basically uh, for much longer than you're supposed to during uh, during a, an acceptance speech such as this. So I imagine eventually he will sort of be be stopped in his uh, in his thank you speech. To, <laughs> yeah, yeah, in order nice. to to receive the the, the award <laughs> finally, so we can move on. Cool. All right. Um. So, um, the Karagai Order of Heroism is straight out of the Command Division source book, um, and is a uh, membership of the Karagai Order of Heroism is granted to Starfleet officers of exceptional heroism, demonstrated in defense of the Federation and its people. Uh, so the character must have faced extreme danger and overwhelming odds in combat or a similar crisis and survived, and also succeeded in defending a Federation world or outpost from loss or destruction. And this uh, order of the office is pinned to your dress uniform, and uh, you also gain this benefit. Once per mission, when you would suffer an injury you can avoid the injury for free. So normally it costs two momentum or threat. Uh, alternatively, once per mission, when the character's ship would suffer one or more breaches, uh, you may either spend two momentum 
or suffer a complication to ignore one of those breaches. Lexer gets very, very, very um, sweaty, but then, like, when he has re- received the, the award and finally is able to sort of step down, he you see him um, breathing out a very big sigh of relief. Uh, and then next up is Alanwo, and she is awarded um, an uh, honorary... Uh, was it, like, a fellowship or something to, a, to an institute? Um, and uh, she goes into... Um, describe a little bit of detail uh, about her work and she is an archaeologist uh, by trade and her and her team um, stumbled upon uh, the remains of uh, this civilization that lived here um, long ago in fact the, they discovered the whole planet was littered with lots of ruins and archaeological evidence of a civilization that um, existed here a few hundred years ago and dating has managed to date it back um, by about 700 years. It seems that an intelligent species lived here um, and their disappearance is now a hotly debated topic among the various scientific institutes around the Federation. For months her archaeological research team has been attempting to discover the cause of the species' mysterious disappearance. Um, One theory obviously leads to the storms here, because this is a perfectly habitable planet, but there is uh, these strange electrified dust storms that uh, rage across uh, various hemispheres now and again. Um... And when the colonists arrived from Cardassia, a uh, hundred or so years ago, I imagine, um, there was a strange absence of higher life forms. Um, just simple plants and single celled organisms. But now she's found that the fossil records clearly show a previous diverse biosphere once existed. All that remains of that world now are the ruined cities left behind by the long, dead humanoids, windswept rocks, and tenacious microorganisms. And she kind of salutes to the USS Berlin and says she is particularly excited to be working with all of you on uh, digging up more that she can figure out this precursor civilization. Yeah, there's there's applause and such. And then... The mood takes a turn for a second as a member of the Cardassian uh, local government delegation um, stands up and begins a short tirade um, against the intrusion that her archaeological team has had on the people of uh, their various towns and city ships. There's a couple of boos and, the, you know, there's that kind of crowded mix of like, a couple of people um, telling him to sit down, a couple of people booing, a couple, you know, one person kind of applauding. So it's that weird, uh, disconnected mix of, of people's responses. But what do you guys do? Well, I feel after the initial hubbub, I would stand up and calmly but firmly inform this individual that this is not the place or time for such things. This is a celebration of achievements, not a place to bring up the problems ongoing or of the past. You are a respected member of your community. If you have an issue, it can be discussed at another time. So I'm trying here, of course, to use my diplomatic focus and my natural calming to calm this individual down and make him see that this is not the place for this sort of thing. Not now, anyway. And if I can, I would like to uh, assist him in uh, in this uh, standing up as well. I mean, I, I'm used to dealing with, uh, with Cardassians and... and um, of, of speaking their language and, and persuading them. Um, so if I can assist him, I would like to do that as well. Yeah, for sure. So what I'm what I'm going to say here, so this uh, would be a presence and command uh, test. I'm willing to uh, hear another option if you guys want as well, if you think you could, it makes sense, a different combination. I think that's good for me. That gives me a 15. Me too. So this would be difficulty three, and what I'm going to say is um, because of Lexor's trait of um, being friend of the Cardassians, um, this is actually going to be reduced in difficulty by uh, to two. 
so you need two successes. Um, Craig, you're rolling two dice as default. You can um, give me some threat to buy more if you'd like. Um, but then, uh, Matthias, you're you're actually rolling one d twenty. And then, if you get a success, and so long as Craig gets a success, you can add that to his. I think we'll risk just two d ten on this one. I think it's okay. You got target number fifteen. You two successes across three dice. I think you'll be all right. Um, during this hubbub, um, Commander Helsing has, of course, moved up to towards the whole situation, so that she will be close at hand if so, if this escalates. So I roll an 11 and a 3, and as it's my focus of diplomacy, well that's still 3 successes. There you go. And I roll an 8. Nice. So that's 4 in total, so that gives you 2 momentum. So you shut this local diplomat down and after he kind of, it I think it's a mix of uh, kind of you guys saying kind of this isn't you know calming him down this isn't the time but he kind of wraps up his point a little bit anyway but it just diffuses the situation quite expertly um, it's then that uh, Tomek your captain suggests that people then enjoy the dinner that's uh, about to be presented and goes into a little bit of you know diplomatic detail about what cuisine they're eating and stuff and um, very uh, effectively and professionally emphasises the sourcing of the local ingredients um, from uh, the colony uh, which also goes to help diffuse the situation I think Yeah, cool uh, is there anything else you guys would like to do here in the um, ceremony otherwise we'll skip ahead I'd love to go and speak to this uh, this Cardassian, just to try to smooth over the situation a little bit, try to make sure that uh, he doesn't have to lose so much face here, um, and to, to show that he's still welcome in spite of having been, been shut down, and that there are no hard feelings. That, of course, I we understand, I the Federation, of course, understands his concerns, and, and they are valid. Um, and, and that they, they will be they will be brought up uh, properly in, in order to in the future uh, make sure that uh, everyone's wishes here are, are respected and that the community isn't disturbed cool why don't you roll for me why don't you roll this is going to be I think presence and command again and I roll a three and a one wow so a one is always two successes and then I have a focus, of course, on both persuasion and Cardassian culture, so I suppose one of those would come into play as well. So, I think it's four successes. It was a one and a three, right? One and a three, yes. It was a very good roll. Yeah, yeah, so... And I rolled an underneath my command of, uh, of uh, four. Two more momentum as well after that. And you successfully uh, calm him down and um, just, rem- you know, remind him he, he is in, you know... He is welcome here and all this kind of stuff. You learn that he is Suscor Pick. Um, that's his Cardassian name. Um, and he um, is has been particularly affected. He looks after a lot of rural colony. Uh, and the archaeological digs have been really intrusive to their farming. They, they've taken a lot of resources and energy uh, getting some um, decent renewable farming techniques for the planet that the storms haven't helped with obviously there have been a few instances where thanks to an application to the federation and the science council farmers and families have literally had to just up sticks and move and um head off so he's been particularly put out and you know he would he would like if he can get it some assistance from the crew or uh, someone he recognises, I mean people you know, I imagine you being a little local celebrity people know that you're a fleet li- liaison officer here and it carries a certain amount of weight to it even though you're a lieutenant, right? You like, you're looking after um, the communications between different vessels in the fleet um, you're actually coordinating some of that effort uh, with a uh, link to an admiral so he's hoping that he can like bend your ear a bit to get you to help and try and not have this be such an intrusion Hmm. And I bend my very, very large ears uh, towards him, and I, I do, uh, and I do my best, uh, of course, after the ceremony ends, to to actually try to, um, to to do something about this. We we don't want this to be an ongoing uh, thing that will will both, of course, disturb the the community, but 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 uh, disturb the this uh, this archaeological uh, dig. We we definitely don't want any 
any problems from this, and it seems like it should be possible to arrange uh, this farming, after all. It, there should be ways around it. I mean, so with four momentum, we've uh, got quite a bit. You guys can save up to six at one, uh, and, and have six in the pool at any one time. I'm just thinking, uh, maybe an option here that you might like to pick up on is uh, what we call on the, on the game, create an advantage. So advantages and complications are two sides of the same coin, and these are traits. So traits are more of a kind of larger narrative fact about the game or the scene in which you're you're playing. And what they do is they influence the actual um, difficulty or the ability to do different tasks. So um, like you had the friend of the Cardassians trait, which lowered the difficulty of that initial uh, persuasion uh, task. You can cr you could maybe create an advantage based off of this conversation um, that might come into play and help you later on. If you want to create an advantage, it costs you two momentum, but then that would just that would leave you with two, um, which is still a still a good amount, really. Yes. Well, I think we should definitely do that. So, what kind of an advantage could we create here? Then would it be the support of the the local population? I mean, I suppose we have it already, but now we have really all, perhaps all of them supporting us. Okay, Craig, Jenny, is there anything you guys wanted to do as a, before I wrap up the scene? As we leave the event, because I, I, I suspect we're heading into like another venue or something to sit down for dinner or something. I actually, I actually walk up to Lexo, and I'm kind of like, well, uh, Lieutenant Lexo, that was an interesting speech. I uh, suspect you've been working on it for <clears throat> quite a while. Oh yeah, yes, I, uh, I've uh, worked on it for. Probably a little bit too long. I, I got the feeling that it, it was a, a bit on, a, a bit a bit too too long. Perhaps yes, it was. Uh, I kind of outstayed my welcome there a, a little bit. But uh, I hope they, that they will forgive me for that. Uh, I was the one being um, honored here, uh, after all. Uh, yes. If your goal was to actually talk people to death, I think you almost succeeded. And I actually. Smile, just a tiny little smile. And I smile as well, and you see my my sharp teeth uh, gleam. At least you didn't offend anyone. That's that's good. Well, congratulations on the honors. Thank you. End of the scene. The momentum pool was reduced by one, so we've got one momentum left for you guys. We move on to let's move on to a briefing where you know typical uh, ready room style stuff where. Um, Heads of department and uh, the senior crew uh, are all sat around that table in Voyager with a little screen on, and it's um, just Lanwa that's um, presenting. And she's much more uh, professional now. She's less nervous. She's used to kind of doing this like scientific talk about her work to people. So she's going through some of the details um, of, of what they found. Essentially, what she's particularly interested in, apart from going over what I've already gone over about that she's basically found lots of archaeological remains of a, of a civilization or a society that were native to the planet that were wiped out about 700 years ago, um, she's particularly interested in um, using the ship's transporter capabilities in order to try and get deep down into um, some of the uh, terrain um, of the um, planet in order to reach remains they've not been able to yet get to and also in addition to that be able to um, be as uh, not as invasive as they were before um, as they've had to do a lot from uh, basically from hand um, so she, in essence, wants to use the ship's transporters in order to bring archaeological remains that they've um, scanned for and found on the planet's surface under kind of particularly sensitive locations so they can actually excavate them uh, that way and then bring them up onto the ship and have a look at them. Hmm. Well, I'd say, as I lean forward in a friendly manner, that that certainly is an interesting idea. We are going to require extensive sensor readings from yourself, though, Alanwa. Naturally, so make sure that we are actually transporting the correct things. Transporter technology can be tricky when you're not exactly sure where the thing you're teleporting is. So, hopefully you have that. But we're happy to assist you if you require more. Of course, yes, of course I have it. And, and she hands you a pad 
um, that's got some fairly threadbare data on it. They've done they've done some um, like uh, surface level geological kind of scans, um, but they're not as accurate as they could be, um, and it's certainly not going to be enough to give you some really reliable transporter um, kind of lock on. You know, I I smile politely, but I will mentally note down that I feel we're going to have to maybe do a bit of work with the ship itself. Luckily, the USS Berlin is equipped with highly advanced sensor suites. So I will look over the readings and say thank you, Alama. This will be sufficient to get started, although I'm afraid we are going to need to do a little bit more work before we can even begin the transportation part of the transportation mission. Yes, I'm thinking, uh, Miss Alanwa, you are not uh, that uh, familiar with transponder, uh, transporters, right? I've been in them, obviously. I understand the basic technology. Do you understand that there is always a uh, security threat when it comes to transporting into unknown areas, uh, sl- specifically underground? There are geological instabilities, there can be gas pockets, there can be... Uh, multiple threats that we cannot, you know, um, take in account from the information you provided. It was my understanding from the Scientific Council that Starfleet would be more than up to the challenge. Well, I guess that's uh, up to the captain to decide. Indeed, don't worry, uh, Commander Helsing. I'll make sure that our information before we go in is as accurate as it can be. And then the captain, of course, will use that information to decide what our next course of action is. So the captain and Temek will say, very good. Commander, see to those uh, scans and make sure we have a much more accurate telemetry of those excavation sites. And Alama, if you can assist, then we'll be able to work much quicker. Hi, Captain. So your duty then is to uh, get these scans going. I mean, you could all uh, work towards this as well. Um, we we don't have to keep things tight to to one person, um, so yeah. So let's uh, let's get scanning. So we're going to bring the ship in as well at this point as well. So um, when the ship uh, when you do something with the ship, it basically assists. So it will roll its own d twenty. Uh, so someone will need to do that, um, and then that will add any successes to your own. Um, so yeah, basically what we need to do uh, in terms of this particular little challenge is uh, get some better telemetry um, and then bring the Um, archaeological pieces on board Um, how would you guys like to approach the scan? Well naturally I will take my position on the bridge and begin directing the ship's personnel assisting myself to begin deep scans, scan telemetries and combine all the data using our advanced sensors I will also tap the side of my head ever so slightly to activate my neural interface which will enable me to assist a little more directly in the process. So, what shall we start rolling? I think this is going to be either science or engineering. In that case, let's go with engineering. So, control engineering. I'm using the sensor system, so there's a focus on this, so that's the only one I need. You have one momentum. Did you want to spend that to roll an extra d20? The difficulty of this test is going to be uh, two, because essentially we're going to be the culmination. Of this is going to be creating an advantage that um, allows you to then uh, beam up the uh, artifacts. Excellent. And we're using the ship sensors. Uh, I'm thinking as well if I could assist in any way. Uh just to do like a risk analysis kind of thing on the telemetry um, just to make sure that nothing bad happens. Sure, I reckon that is a reason and security check. I currently got a 10 and a 13, so two successes. I got one. How many successes do we need again? Uh, Two. And you got three in total. In that case, I'm not going to bother rerolling anything. Um, Actually, I suppose did our ship sensor get anything the ship has different uh, attributes so it has systems and departments the departments are the same as your own um d- uh, disciplines but the systems reflect the different systems of the ship so this is using the ship's sensors that's a 10 and science for a four yeah it's a target of 14 and ships always have a focus so uh, anything a four or under will get you two successes 
And that's a 16. That's not good enough. Even though we have enough successes, just for the purpose of maybe getting some momentum, how about I re-roll my one 16 due to my technical expertise, which means when I'm assisted by computers or sensors, I may re-roll 1d20. And that is a far more exciting 5, which I believe is one more success, yes. You've created the advantage now that um, basically you've got the exact telemetry that you need, and Alanwa is kind of overseeing, and she's just uh, she's not actually doing anything practically, but she's just reviewing the work, and she's very excited to see you lock in and hone in on the different artifacts that she wants to beam up. And you've got two momentum as well. Did you want to spend any to ask any questions about the scene or about the artifacts that you're scanning? Why don't we just spend one momentum? to maybe get a bit of extra information. For example, anything unusual about either the places we're scanning or the artifacts themselves, any strange readings? You don't receive any strange readings, um, but the life forms or the the kind of, you know, the skeletons of the X life forms, I guess, um, that you are beaming up um, also have some uh, evidence of um, kind of metal, um, mechanical, perhaps biomechanical stuff with them, different matter. Yes, I'm glad everything seems to go well. I do mention to Ilwana that at one point there does seem to be some mild subspace interference that I have to reroute a few conduits to bypass, but it seems as if the operation is going successfully. Nice. The next thing is going to be beaming those uh, artifacts aboard. So uh, the best place to do this is down at one of the transporter rooms. So you folks head down in order to see that see to that work. And I happen to have a focus on transporter systems. Nice. Uh, you might want to be the one to to have a go with it. Then. Certainly, and I will assist using command to simply give you the information I've already worked out to hopefully assist you and because I'm using hopefully command to help I shall you, you get a re-roll on a d20 and I will stay as far as way uh, far away from the transporter as I possibly can this is an control and engineering task normally with a difficulty of two but it's assisted by the ship's sensors and engineering uh, this difficulty increases by plus one if the target is not on a transporter pad. So that's fine. You folks can uh, tr- beam it to the transporter pad here on the ship. Or if you like, you can actually beam it into one of the labs that is set up for this um, more directly. Alanwa obviously asks that it can be beamed up to the uh, in situ, uh, but that is going to be difficulty four. We'll just do that. And due to the some storms in the atmosphere, um, I'm actually going to increase that by one as well. So if we want to do a site-to-site transport, we're going to be looking at difficulty of five. Um, if we want to just uh, bring it to the transporter bay here, then we're looking at difficulty four. One of the labs would be the most... Reasonable thing, I think. Well, right, let's let's roll them all together, right? So, um, because so first of all, Matthias, did you want to add um, any dice? We've got one momentum, so that can get you another d20. Okay, so we spend the one momentum. Um, we can take another. Th- we can take a threat also. Would that give us then one die, or would we have to take two threat to add another? Yeah. So, uh, you roll two d20 by default. Uh, if you you spend that one momentum to get a third dice. If you want a fourth dice, it's going to cost you another two threat. All right, well, let's do that. So I'm up to nine now, just for reference. I started out with some as you guys started the session. All right. So that would then be two plus two dice. That's four dice. Yeah, so you're rolling 4d20. Craig's rolling another another one. A ship gets one as well. Ship gets one as well. Jenny, why don't you roll for the ship? So then that would give us a total of six, and we have to hit five of those. Uh, so, uh, this is uh, sensors and engineering, right? So this is going to be a 13 crits on twos. 
One, three, seven, five. It's like six successes. Yes. And and I rolled an eight, so I succeeded as well. So that's seven. Jenny? Yeah, one for the ship as well. I rolled an eight. Oof. So that's eight successes in total. Giving you three momentum. All right, friends. Amazing. So you managed to cut through the interference with uh, your transporter expertise um, and you uh, beam uh, the various samples and remains um, into a large laboratory down on one of the lower decks. Um, Through the comms, they acknowledge that they have received all they need um, and Alanwa is ecstatic. She's ready to begin work. I smile and give a nod to Lexor saying, good work on uh, tempering the spatial interference there. Good work. Thank you. That went uh, a lot better than uh, I would have thought. I I suppose I have the the lobes for transporter systems, huh? Let's bring everyone in on uh, a scene now. So let's reduce that down to two momentum as we start a new scene down in the low those lower decks. Uh, where Alanwa takes you and invites you to uh, look over uh, what's what's happening because she's just so pleased that you you were the folks that were involved in actually making this work for her um, and she wants to show off um, what she's uh, found. So you head down to the lower decks, you head into this large laboratory, a bit like a, a kind of cargo bay, quite high ceiling, uh, there's various kind of diagnostic tools and various kind of little kind of mobile scanning units and stuff in place and uh, a few scientists in the usual duty uniform um, going between samples as laid out um, in one corner kind of larger remains of perhaps buildings and different bits of technology and stuff like that and then laid out on various almost kind of like morgue um, tables. Uh, Your staff, uh, your crew have already began piecing together, working with some of the archaeological team. Various skeletons and they're trying to uh, piece together um, different parts and humanoid forms are starting to appear on the tables as well. Among these humanoid forms, as you look between the different remains, are uh, cybernetics. uh, What the uh, what Starfleet would consider cybernetics. So this is uh, metal devices, uh, arms, legs, uh, sensory organs, um, even different artificial organs. They're in varying different states of decay uh, as they're quite old, quite kind of rudimentary by today's standards, are all also kind of in amongst these remains. Um, either, um, you know, Notably, very obviously, like come from uh, a rib cage or uh, like a pelvic region or a leg or an arm or something, um, and even sensory organs from uh, that are actually embedded in skulls and in the faces and stuff of these humanoids. Hmm, I go in and study that. That I mean, cybernetics are. Uh, would you say they are fairly common, or uh, you don't see them that often uh, in the quadrant? They're not that common, um, actually. Medicine, particularly for the Federation and the different um, other civilizations that border it, haven't taken much to cybernetics. They, uh, because of the medicine involved, because of the non-invasive treatments they've managed to um, factor in um, to their practice. So this kind of speaks to a civilization that was trying to maybe fix things or maybe heal their citizens with uh, artificial means rather than trying to uh, patch up the actual limbs and stuff does does it seem like all the 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 skeletons have some sort of augmentation or i'll let you either spend momentum or we can make a check in order to try and figure that out but if if you want to spend a momentum I'll, i'll answer that truthfully let's spend a momentum yeah, we've got two in the pool. So let's spend that once. We've got one left. And yeah, as you look round, um, as Alan was speaking, you start to be kind of quite distracted by it. Um, 
so Commander Helsing kind of phases that out a little bit um, in terms of her, of her head. And you walk around the different uh, remains that are here of the different humanoids that are being pieced together. And you, you get like a bit of a shiver down your spine as you realize that all of these remains, every single one of them, has some kind of cybernetics. And it's one corpse that, or one skeletal remains that really kind of stops you in your tracks as you look down at it. And it's got a, its left forearm has been completely and entirely replaced by what looks to be quite a rudimentary uh, kind of claw um, or it's got various sort of kind of instruments on the end of it that remind that actually remind you weirdly of some kind of Borg technology. Could I roll uh, like an insight engineering or security to check if any of these are weapons? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think this is going to be because of the state of decay they're in and because of the unknown nature of them I think this is going to be difficulty three but this is going to be absolute yeah insight and security um, and yeah you're you've got one momentum and you're free to buy dice as you'd like if that's okay with you guys I would like to do buy a third one please do please do yes all right so no momentum left in the pool and you've got three d20s to roll you're not gonna believe this two ones <laughs> and I'm gonna roll a, a, a third die and an eight. So yeah, that's what five. Five successes. Yeah, two momentum. You look through a few more. You can't tell if the arm replacement that you saw that gave a kind of shiver down your spine is a weapon. Um, so you look for the others, and uh, you do eventually find. It would look as if if this skeletal arm had flesh on it. It would look like as if the augmentation was would have been like kind of coming out of the skin like growing out of the skin rather than a full replacement and this to your mind is got to be some kind of laser cutter or phaser emitter or energy based weapon it's got to be something uh, i walk over to lieutenant commander Cater and um, kind of wait for her to finish whatever it is she's doing at the moment before i ask for her attention. <laughs> you see me finish quite quickly because as you know with me, I just suddenly get a look in my eye, feeling that you are anxious about something. Commander Helsey, something the matter? I have assessed the situation a bit and mm, I might be s entirely wrong yeah, since I don't know the, the precise technical uh, circumstance of all this, but um, I could got this gut feeling um, that this might be connected to the Borg. The Borg? And as you say that, like, Alexor, of course, has uh, acute hearing as a Ferengi, and you just see him sort of jolt and like, Borg? You have listened to an episode of Red Moon Roleplaying, where we played Star Trek Adventures and the scenario In the Pale Red Moonlight. Our game master was Sam Webb, who is line developer on the game for Modiphius. The music was created by Alpha Zone and Sabled Sun and was used with permission by their label, Cryochamber. Check them out at cryochamber.bandcamp.com or their YouTube channel for more drone. We would like to give massive thanks to our champions of the Red Moon, Martin Hoshobert, Nastasha Rollerson, Simon Cooper, David, Julia, and David Hogbatty for their generous support. And we'd of course like to thank all of our other patrons. Without your support, the show would not be possible. If you want to support our work, please check us out on Patreon. You can get access to bonus campaigns for Cult Divinity Lost and Coriolis there, as well as get early and raw access to all of our recordings. You can also hear your name read on the show as a champion of the Red Moon, as well as play cult with us. Most importantly, that support is what keeps the show going, so do check us out there. And remember, resistance is futile. <laughs>